Welcome to Politics Aside. Appreciate you spending time with us today. My name is John Porter, and I'm excited to talk about some key topics today that I really think are of interest, especially today, is what's happening across the street at the U.S. Capitol. My goal is periodically to share with you some of the experts that I've worked with through my career in public service. And today, uh, two of the stellar parts of the Porter team are going to be with us, who I'll introduce here in a moment. We're going to talk about reconciliation and what does that mean. We're going to talk about appropriations. What does that mean? We're going to talk about manufacturing and defense. What does all of that mean? All I ask is that you sit back, enjoy, and put politics aside. You know, some of the top issues that we're facing, as I, as I uh, mentioned in my opening, reconciliation, appropriation, manufacturing, and defense, uh, those are key issues for the ins insiders here on Capitol Hill. But when I review what's happening across the country, uh, those are not the top issues that at least the Gallup poll says are key to Americans today. Uh, U.S. Gallup poll today, uh, August the 2nd, said uh, out of the thousand people they interviewed between July 5th and July 26th in the Newsweek, that judicial system and courts are number six. So that's number four in a priority for the American people. Abortion is number three at 8% on the scale. Dysfunction of government and bad leadership surprise is tied at 17% with inflation at 17%. So as the president has mentioned as recently as last week, President Biden is urging Congress to put politics aside. So I really thought it was appropriate to put politics aside and talk about four surprise pieces of legislation that have come up just in the last couple of weeks. One of those is the highly anticipated CHIPS legislation. We're going to talk about that. No, not CHIPS and salsa, but what is CHIPS? We're going to talk about that and what it means. Uh, also, appropriations. Where does it stand in funding of the government and different projects across the country? Uh, both houses have made major progress on appropriations bills, which is pretty historic at this stage of the, of the Congress. Third, Defense bills, uh, both houses as well, have made major progress on the defense and annual spending bills. And finally, the biggest surprise of the week is reconciliation. It was a surprise not only to the elected officials here on Capitol Hill, but certainly to the pundits and to the press. And everyone is still scratching their head as to what does, what does this mean? Where's the Senate? Where's the House? Where are they going to be in a couple of weeks? Well, I'm joined today, as I mentioned, by two uh, of my team at the Porter Group, who I consider experts. Uh, I can ask the most any question and they'll let me know when they don't know, but they will let me know when they do know. And these are key, excuse me, key areas that I think are really important. Uh, both of our team members, Mr. Ben Rosenbaum and Stephanie Walker, were legislative directors um, on the Hill. Uh, Mr. Rosenbaum worked for Congresswoman Titus and Stephanie Walker worked for Congresswoman Mark Amity. So would you please welcome our team, provide really unique perspective on things that are happening by the moment. So moving on, Ben, tell us what this chip stuff is. And I know it's not about margaritas. I know it's not chips and salsa, but it's, it's on everyone's mind in DC, but I don't know that it's on everyone else's mind across the country. So can you tell yeah. us? What's going on, Ben? Yeah, Congressman. Well, um, it's it's not surprising that you may refer to it as chips and salsa. This has had this bill has had a lot of names over the years. Uh, a lot of attention has been brought to this issue of semiconductors and the Chips Act in recent weeks with this sort of breakthrough in in a deal and um, moving it to the president's desk in sort of a surprising fashion. But this effort really began uh, nearly three years ago. Uh, there was an effort in the National Defense Authorization, a piece of legislation we're going to talk about a little later, uh, to invest in America's domestic manufacturing for semiconductors. I think, you know, you you think of semiconductors for the Defense Department, we're thinking missile guidance, high-powered computing, all types of gadgets and, and gizmos that are important for our national defense. But it's also important for, you know, the things that we have in our homes. Uh, our telephones, our televisions, our automobiles all require these semiconductors, these, these microchips uh, to operate. But we have seen over the years a real decrease in U.S. manufacturing and U.S. leadership when it comes to this type of technology. I found one, uh, one note that uh, about 12% of chips currently are manufactured here in the United States, and that's down from 37% in the 1990s. So it shows how far we have fallen. 
Uh, the Congressional Research Service has indicated that four fifths of all global cons uh, manufacturing was in Asia in 2019. So it shows how this the manufacturing hubs around semiconductors and this type of technology have really shifted to Asia and specifically to China. So this effort in a couple of years back really began as an effort to not only address U.S. manufacturing and try to bring back manufacturing to the United States, but also to compete with Asia. And that's why when you know this bill, these bills and these ideas were first talked about, one of the original names was the U.S. Innovation and Competition Act. It's also been called Endless Frontiers, Chips for America, America Competes, the Chips Act, and now finally the official name, the Creating Helpful Incentives to Produce Semiconductors or Chips and Science Act. Oh, hey Ben, before you go on, so how does Congress come up with names like that? Uh, well, oftentimes it's an intern, I, I have to say, uh, you know, sometimes you just task folks to think about what are the meaning, what's the meaning of the bill, what's the goal of the bill, what are things associated with what it's trying to do, and then you come up with an acronym or a fun word, um, it's, it's not as much of a science or pollsters as you may think. Um, but it, it, it sometimes can be as, as much of, as an intern or staff assistant who may have a good idea for an acronym. Well, I think we should do a show just on terms and titles for legislation, but we'll save that for another day. Uh, you mentioned the percentages that were at 13% now compared to we were 37%. So what is that going to do for my gallon of milk at the store or when I go fill up the car on things that are really important to the American people, according to Gallup poll today? How yeah. does this going to matter? So this is part of a broader effort by both this administration, but it's a bipartisan effort that we have seen to try to address um, the, the manufacturing in the United States, uh, supply chain issues generally. Um, and so back in 2020, when they were working on the next defense authorization, they there was a lot of uh, programs and policies and investment to for the Department of Commerce, for the Department of State and the Department of Defense to identify where these gaps were. Where are the, the problems with, with our supply chain that are going to cause national security issues and just economic uncertainty and reliance on China and other countries? Um, and so that is sort of the beginning blocks for what has now become this legislation, which is going to, to put forward over the next five years, $52 billion for semiconductor research and development, for incentive programs, there's tax credits in there specific to the semiconductor sector, uh, a 25% uh, investment tax credit for manufacturing through 2026. All of these are supposed to build to help build the blocks for a, res uh, a, a, a resumption of advanced manufacturing in the United States, specifically on the semiconductor um, industry. But it should have spillover to a lot of other industries, help the automotive industry, uh, our, our tech industries, um, be able to, to re not rely on Asia and foreign suppliers for this really important technology. As we saw during the COVID pandemic and the slowdown at some of these plants, um, that reliance is, has taken a very long time for us to be able to catch up. And so we're seeing you know, a lack of supply of semiconductor chips around the world, and that is resulting in increased prices for automobiles, increased prices for uh, industries that rely on transportation um, to get things to market. So why now, Ben? And forget my comments about how does it fit into a gallon of milk, but why now? Apparently this has been happening. Is it supply chain driven or why, what, why today? I think a lot of this stems from sort of competition with Asia and competition with China in particular. And there's been this 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 ongoing economic battle around the world when it comes to China and the United States. Um, and this is part of that that I guess that fight uh, that we're we're trying to resume our the United States um, uh, leadership in manufacturing and the semiconductor part of it is is just a huge part because it is in so many products that we rely on. So it is a, it's a national defense issue as much as it is an economic and supply chain issue. So how soon will we see the benefits of this? So it's passed both, both houses, correct? Correct. Uh, and going to the White House? Correct. And how long does this trickle down effect? Is it going to take 10 years, 20 years, five years? When will we see this on the street? 
helping. So the bill appropriates funds immediately, and it will it'll be spread out over the next five years. There are already underway um, efforts to expand and build new semiconductor manufacturing um, fab plants around the country. We know of two that in the Phoenix area that are underway under construction now. So this will help speed up that process and help expand um, some of that work. It'll also invest in some of the research programs. Uh, we've got investments for NASA, investments for the Department of Energy, National Institutes of Standards and Technology, and the National uh, the National Science Foundation, which will all provide grants for universities across the country and research institutions to look into new ways to um, produce these these chips, uh, more energy efficient ways to utilize them. Um, and so all of this money will start going out over the next year or so uh, in, in, in its first tranche, and then will continue over the next five years. Well, I think NASA funding helped develop Tang, if I remember growing, giving my vintage and maybe even Velcro. So I'm counting on some new products here that come out of this. Uh, and, and I guess before we leave the topic, in fairness, you know, it's easy to attack Congress and the U.S. Senate for being inactive. They've actually had a pretty active year and they've done a, really have done a lot of things in a bipartisan manner. Absolutely. This one's pretty historic as well, isn't it? And a bipartisan support. Uh, it really is. House. Yeah, so the Senate took of the first vote on the final package of this deal. It was a 64 to 33 vote, so it, it eclipsed that 60 vote threshold that we're oftentimes looking for, bipartisan support, including the Senate Minority Leader, Mitch McConnell, uh, who doesn't always agree with Senator Schumer, uh, especially in an election year. You don't often see these kind of major policy bills move forward. And then in the House side, uh, which followed the Senate vote, there was an effort on the Republican side, the Republican minority, the Republican leader, um, Mr. McCarthy, he whipped against this bill, said it was we should start over. But um, there were a number of Republicans that did support it, 24 in particular, and including some high ranking officials, um, the ranking Republican on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, the ranking Republican on the House Appropriations Committee. So those are two members, both from Texas, who, you know, there's a major semiconductor and tech industry in the state, but it shows that they recognize kind of that, you know, maybe this isn't a perfect bill, but it is definitely a step forward in addressing some of our national security and supply chain and manufacturing needs and uh, is setting the stage for kind of uh, a resumption of leadership in some of these areas that we've been working on for many years. Well, I, I know a number of our viewers uh, watched as a company at the Porter Group. We work and try to make, and make it work whoever's in office. And, and our role is to make sure that uh, the, the, our friends, family, and of course clients have an understanding of what's happening. But I do think, even though this program is called Politics Aside, I guess we should address the politics of this topic. So what's happened now? Republicans are upset because they had some kind of deal. Uh, tell, tell us what that's about, Ben. Well, a lot of this will spill over to other things. So, you know, as the discussions on the chips bill were underway and there was an agreement to move forward, it all kind of spilled over to a, another topic we're going to talk about, which is the reconciliation package. It also spilled over to the appropriations package, which we're going to talk about. It also spills over to the defense authorization we're going to talk about. All of these different bills are linked in many ways, um, but it does set, sort of set the stage for you know, um, if, you know, there are some members who may not want to support something, even if it is a policy they may have some agreement with and some things they don't like, but maybe they think we could do better if, we, if we're in charge and we're writing the bill. So it's just sort of this give and take that we see in Congress all the time. Um, but, uh, you know, I think we'll probably get more into this as we sort of talk about the reconciliation package, because I think that's where we really sort of see the politics of, of all these things come to head. Well, Ben, I actually set you up for that because that's a perfect transition to a topic that Stephanie's going to talk about, and that is reconciliation. What in the world is that? What's that all about, Stephanie? I think Ben set it up really well. Yeah, so uh, in a really major summer surprise, Congress uh, of the Senate really came out with a reconciliation uh, compromise of, with Senator Manchin, who had been kind of a holdout in the Democratic Party. So I'll quickly explain a budget reconciliation is where it's a vehicle where you can do budgetary legislation or policies without a 60 vote threshold in the Senate. You only have to have 51 votes. So it can be a really beneficial tool when you control both houses of Congress to pass some of your top priorities. Uh, you probably remember back in winter 
or at least the first quarter of this year, the House passed the Build Back Better Act, which was their starting point for reconciliation. And that bill was extremely partisan because the Democrats in the House never have to pass at the three quarters, you know, threshold. They don't have a 60 percent threshold. They just pass a simple majority. So they could do their wish list. That's the kind of the the Build Back Better was sort of the Biden administration, House progressive, House moderate, wish list, everything goes type type of bill. So what we have now, which was still a huge surprise, by the way, actually every analyst in D.C., every headline on this was surprise <laughs> reconciliation bill because we all thought it was completely dead, uh, at least before the election. Um, but it's come out. It looks like Senator Manchin has agreed to some provisions. Um, so th there are three sort of key things in the bill. Uh, the first is what they're calling a corporate tax fairness, which sets a 15% minimum corporate tax rate. So it doesn't actually change the corporate tax rate, which will remain 21%, but it says for the, the about 200 largest companies in the nation, it's two, it's a, it's 1 billion revenue or more. You cannot pay less than 15% of your revenue in any given year, meaning you can't use deductions or credits, which will take your, your tax share lower than 15%. Um, right now, a company can sort of choose either I'm going to pay taxes or I'm going to give this money to charity, to clean energy investment, to uh, asset carryover, whatever you, there's a lot, there's a myriad of deductions and credits you can use to lower your tax burden. So now it says, if you make a billion or more gross revenue, you cannot pay less than 15, period. Um, the next element, which is probably the biggest partisan um, sticking point are the clean energy elements in the bill. They're pretty extensive. The, the number one focus of this reconciliation bill is the climate change focus. So what it does is, first of all, it implements the methane fee, which has been floating around for a really long time, actually, within the Democratic Party. Um, they, the Build Back Better introduced one version of it. This is a scaled back version that industry is more comfortable with. It's more of a compromise. Um, so that would go across the entire oil and gas industry. Um, it also would, which by the way, it's $900 a ton. I don't know how many oil and gas executives are on here to know to know the exact amount, but that's what it'll be. Um, they're also going to, uh, they had a compromise on offshore uh, drilling. So they're going to increase the leasing fees for offshore oil and gas drilling. But they did say that if they're going to implement offshore wind development, they first have to, within that 60 acre area of any given wind development project, they have to also offer oil and gas leases if they're going to do that. So that was sort of a big industry compromise on that issue. Um, they also are going to do um, something kind of new and exciting that I think a lot of people have been waiting for, which would be uh, an increase to the electric vehicle tax credit, which would be for individuals. So um, it would, you could do 7,500 for a new car tax credit or 5,000 for a used car. There'd be income limits on this, uh, but it's it's pretty, everyone's really excited for that one, I think, from, from the perspective of regular Americans participating in the fight against climate change. There also will be various credits and deductions that'll be available to manufacturers and to individuals to decarbonize homes and manufacturing plants, work, workplaces. And then finally, one of the sort of the, the biggest compromises I think that you'll find in this climate package is that where the tax credits and the investments exist within the bill, because there's some competitive grants as well, the bill does not make expressly clear what exactly is going to count as a clean energy project. And this is probably where they got Senator Manchin on board. So the bill allows that if you can prove that your project is gonna clean, decarbonize the system, it could count as clean energy and it doesn't matter what kind of fuel that is. So this probably gets into the carbon capture system, which has been a little controversial within the democratic, more environmental side of the po political community. Um, Carbon capture has been long argued by the coal industry as something that's very beneficial to the environment, but some people think that it's just sort of a 
it, it doesn't get to the heart of the problem and they'd rather move away from coal. But allowing for possible use of carbon capture is probably why Senator Manchin ended up on board. And then the final piece of the bill is a change to Medicare policy, which allows for Medicare to negotiate on 10 different drugs with pharmaceutical companies for their list price. I know that sounds like, how could that be controversial? But it is, <laughs> they've been fighting over it for a long time. Uh, there's a lot of fear, particularly on the Republican side, that if you negotiate price in that way, it could stifle innovation, particularly for orphan drugs, as they call them, which are drugs that treat uh, rare diseases. Um, so they think that the ability for Medicare to drive down a price like that could really hurt American competition. On the other side, there's criticism that why is pharmaceuticals, why are they the only thing in healthcare being targeted in this kind of negotiation with Medicare when it's actually only 15% of our healthcare spending uh, in the entire marketplace? So people think, hey, why can't we negotiate with hospitals, doctors, inpatient, whatever we need to? So there's sort of two sides of the coin, sort of the more progressive side wants us to negotiate across the board and some, the more conservative side worries that that will hurt innovation. So that's sort of the whole package. Um, it's not gonna get a single Republican vote. So Joe Biden and, and Manchin and Schumer, they need every single Democrat to show up and vote. Uh, the problem being several have been sick. It looks like everyone's healthy. So they have their numbers lining up. Um, the current person who's holding out is Senator Sinema. Um, she's been coy about whether or not she will support the bill or not. She has not said, she says she will not say. So <laughs> to be seen. Um, additionally, we actually, it has not cleared the parliamentarian yet. So I think the bill, my opinion is that the bill is scaled back enough that it, it will clear the parliamentarian based on what I've read. But ultimately the parliamentarian is a nonpartisan body that has to decide if it meets the rule of reconciliation. Well, Steph, can I you ask might... a question? I mean, I have a couple, but uh, the first one is who really thinks expanding IRS is a good thing? Yeah, good question. So another <laughs> one of the elements of this bill, along with that 15% minimum, is more money to the IRS. I, would um, not, it, I don't like that part of the bill. Actually. Yeah, so it's interesting because that part of the bill is actually a revenue generating part of the bill. So I'm even sure though, <laughs> yeah, even though they're spending more money, the, the Congressional Budget Office says they're going to make more money because they're going to be increasing enforcement on particularly corporations who they feel have not paid taxes appropriately. So if I'm a business, you need to really double, triple check your, your tax liabilities as this is really ramping up because it's like that theory, if there's a police officer on the phone, don't be offended, that theory that the police officers have quotas on their speeding tickets, right? <laughs> it's kind of like that with the IRS now. Well, I bring that there's... one up with a smile. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know anyone that says, oh yeah, let's, let's get more money to the IRS. So I, anyway, say that with a smile. Right. Uh, and let's talk about this minimum 15%. So hearing all the arguments about it, does that mean that some of the major corporations will stop helping charities and, and they'll eliminate some deductions? Uh, by eliminating deductions, that a lot of these programs that are being funded by corporations now will have to seek federal funding or local funding? Yeah, I mean, that's, I, I can only speak in theory, but in theory, the reason that deductions exist is because even though the money, it did not go to the taxpayer through the general fund. It, in theory, went to the taxpayer through whatever the company was paying for, whether they bought local assets, whether they bought local land, they whatever, charity, clean energy. So in theory, with a 15% minimum, these larger corporations, instead of dodging that tax, dodging is maybe a derogatory word, instead of avoiding that tax penalty by giving, let's say, to charity, they will just pay the tax and not to give to charity, but the money will be a wash. So theoretically, the actual impact of that change could be that certain charities who have been relying on endowments from companies for a long time might lose that endowment, but their people that they're providing services to might be able to receive that service a different way through the government. That would be the theory of the money being fungible. Well, and I, and I hear the argument that this is not a tax increase. And is that theory because if they're going to lower prescription drugs and, and give tax breaks for automobiles or whatever, 
that you're going to pay more in taxes, but you're going to actually pay less when you calculate? Is that how they can say you're not raising taxes? Again, I don't know. I'm trying to figure it out. I don't quite. So I guess you could say they didn't change the corporate tax rate. So it's not a raise in that the corporate tax rate remains the same. But because they're limiting the deductions, the change for adding those clean energy deductions and credits don't really, it doesn't really matter because if you're over, if you're one of those 200 large corporations, you can't use them below the 15%. So I, I, it's definitely not a tax raise for individuals that I can see in any sense of imagination. For smaller industry where they're dealing with some of those new fees for methane and the climate related fees, um, that I, I, I guess you could say it might balance because you might have to pay the higher fee for the lease, but if you're participating in these programs to lower your carbon footprint, you can get the credit back for that. So that's probably where they're saying there's a wash. Um, but yeah, for individuals, I, I don't see, there's not a direct if, you're, if your favorite charity no longer has funding or they have to seek additional resources someplace, uh, and those charities are helping individuals, especially the people they need help the most. I was just trying to figure out the, the logic of how this works and how, how what's going to happen in transition. Or is this an immediate fifteen percent, or is it transitioned? No, it'd be immediate. So it would go into effect right away. Um, obviously, not this upcoming April, but the next taxable year. So have they talked about doing a clawback then, or is it actually going to likely be, or maybe the regs haven't, been, I'm sure they probably aren't prepared yet, but I wonder if it's going to be for 22 or 23. Yeah, so some of it, so I don't, I don't believe there's a clawback. I'm sorry if I'm misspeaking, but my understanding is there isn't. Um, but some of it actually is definitely going to be decided by the IRS with their authority, particularly, particularly the enforcement side. You asked about the increase of, of money for the IRS. Um, the IRS this year put out a strategic plan, which goes through 2026. Um, it's extremely long. I won't get into all of it, but a lot of it details changes to enforcement um, to sort of modernize how the IRS operates. And that's what we're going to see happening with that money, um, including on this new 15%. Okay. So we talked a little bit about titles uh, with Ben. I picked on Ben on titles. So what's the title of this bill and how did they come up with this title set? It's the Inflation Reduction Act, um, which is titled as such because America is very scared about inflation and it's an election year. So that's what they wanted to name it. Um, also because in theory, if you raise, if you make money more difficult to come by, it does combat inflation. That is how it works. So if, if corporations are giving to the government instead of at their choice to random charities or whatever, and we keep using charity, but there's a million other kinds of tax yeah, yes. breaks they could be using. Um, uh, they then it can it can help stifle inflation down. That that would be, I think, the credible reason that they did it. But the more political reason would just be because inflation is scary and people want to reduce it. So, so as part of this, uh, you know, convention, give me back. Conventional wisdom is that Republicans likely would take control of the House this fall. Uh, based upon reapportionment, you know, redistricting, all this stuff. Uh, and uh, even some of the environmental issues of the, normally where the White House stands, it does impact the, the, sh the shift mid term for administration. So is part of this a sense of rush to pass some legacy legislation while Democrats feel that they have control of both houses? Is this, is this part of the legacy thing? This yeah, I mean, when you, yeah, when you look at the three things in this bill, it's the sort of the three pillars of what Democrats have been running on for the last two cycles. I mean, you have corporate pays their fair share, climate change, big pharma. It's, you got you got kind of the big three going. Um, so I think absolutely, it's it, it, it's political and practical. They are achieving things that they are seeking to achieve, but certainly um, it's hitting sort of target talking points of things they said that they would address in their campaigns. So we talked a little bit about chips and salsa and how it impacts, you know, moms and dads and small businesses and the, you know, the, the real people in America and not the politicos. Uh, what, so what will this re reconciliation mean to somebody in Des Moines or in Kansas City or in Nevada or in Virginia? Why does this? Well, 
It can do, it can do a couple things because at first it might seem like energy prices increase. It might be, uh oh, um, because energy prices are already high and we're going to increase the cost to lease. However, uh, when you're looking at long term impacts and you look at more availability of other kinds of energy, like clean energy, um, it could reduce burden in the long run. Um, so it's kind of immediate impact. Uh, yeah, you might see a raise, not going to lie, at the gas station or on your energy bills. But long term, it would be great for there to be competitors in the energy market that made us more stable, longer term with more available energy, which would, in theory, lower everyone's burden over time. Um, the tax one, that to be seen on how that's going to impact those large corporations, whether or not that will see a huge withdrawal from local um priorities like you had said that the one piece that could impact that we aren't quite seeing is some of those deductions come from investment in things like child care for workers um even like equipment that could have been sourced from a local company those kinds of things you might see a little downturn in in business however if it does what it's supposed to do it's sort of like an anti it's like a reverse stimulus it could dampen inflation, which could bring down the prices of things like eggs, milk, bread. That's what they're trying to do. So if it, it succeeds with what they're trying to do, then you could see cost of goods go but down in inflation. But not likely by election day, right? <laughs> not by election day, no, unfortunately. So by election day, you actually might see a market reaction to this that is negative. So it's a little bit bold to do this from an economic point of view, because we did just enter a recession officially. Actually, the, the Department of Commerce did confirm that to the Biden administration. And it's kind of unusual to raise taxes in a recession. So we're in this weird place where we have this high inflation. I won't say hyper because I don't want to hyperbolize, um, but and a recession. So you kind of, to combat one, you kind of hurt the other one. So it is really still, I think, the Republicans game in November, no matter what this bill does. And as I mentioned earlier, our role is to make it work. You know, we're, we're not here to judge, uh, only give our perspective on what it means and what it may mean to our the communities and family and friends that we talk to. Um, I guess moving on to unlimited budget, unlimited support, unlimited uh, support on Capitol Hill, especially, that's defense. So. Uh, ben, this is an easy topic, right? Unlimited amount of money, Defense Appropriation Act happens all the time. They put it off till December usually because it's the one bill that has to pass every session. Yeah. So it hangs out there, they add stuff to it, they take stuff away from it. So w tell us about the, the defense appropriate, infamous Defense Appropriation Act and what does it mean and where does it stand now? Yeah, so every year Congress takes up the National Defense Authorization Act, the NDAA as it's referred to. This is, as you said, a must pass piece of legislation. Uh, I know we'll start talking a little in a little bit about appropriations. Um, these are the terms we sort of hear about appropriations and authorization. Appropriations is the actual funds, the dollar amounts, the chips bill that we talked about. That's actually appropriating funds towards these things. The Which defense means spending money, right? actually spending the money, spending. funding those federal programs, those federal grants, those dollars go out the door. In the authorization, you are setting what the funding priorities should be, what the policies should be. And because of that, um, because it's an authorization bill, you can do a whole lot of things with it. Um, and this is one of those things that at the end of the year, you start seeing a lot of stuff get, get added to it. Things that may not have to do with national defense or maybe very a little connection to national defense, um, but it is a must pass piece of legislation. And in uh, it starts earlier in the year, the committees have these marathon markups and then they bring the bills to the floor. At least this is how it's supposed to happen. Uh, uh, and then at the end of the year, they negotiate, they finalize the bill and all these additional things find their way into it. Um, I can give you a little background on where we are in the process as of now. So the House started this process earlier in the spring. Uh, they had kind of this a, a two day markup uh, at the end of it, it uh, last month, they brought the bill to the floor. There were 1200 amendments filed on this bill. Uh, which and is you and Steph read every one of them. We went through all I'm not of joking. them. <laughs> I know, um, I know. 
And, uh, and, you know, the result is a bill that is over 800 and I believe $40 billion, which is a record for the defense authorization. But it doesn't just include the programs for the Department of Defense. Um, it also includes things for the State Department, it includes things for our intelligence agencies, includes things for the Department of Homeland Security, as well as some other things that kind of find their way in. As I was kind of looking through some of the amendments that were passed, some of the provisions of the bill, there were a few things that kind of stood out. Some are defense related, some are not. Um, there's one that requires that all flags being flown at U.S. bases and installations are American made. It's a little surprising that this isn't already the policy. Um, there's safe harbor protections for financial institutions that work with cannabis industry. So there's marijuana policy in here. Uh, there's reductions on mortgage insurance. And that's the defense bill, right? And this is the defense bill, mind you. Right. Uh, there's reductions on mortgage insurance premiums for first time home buyers for certain federal loan programs. There's uh, equitable benefits for TSA agents, the folks at the airport who keep us safe to make sure that they're in line with other federal law enforcement agencies. And then there's even an amendment, and this one has kind of stood out, um, to authorize the use of MDMA and psilocybin, which is the psychedelic drug more commonly known as magic mushrooms, uh, for alternatives to opioid treatments for service members. So there's a whole host of things in there, as well as public lands bills. So there's things with the Department of Interior. There's a whole host of things that people get in there because this is one of those bills that has to pass by the end of the year. And it's the, and unlike the appropriations bill, this is an area where you can make changes to policy. Um, so that's why you start to see some of these things that are pet projects and pet policies that members have on both sides of the aisle find their way into a piece so of So it's not normally the bill that's the problem. It's everything they try to attach to it as it's moving. I mean, you could argue that maybe a little bit of the dysfunction of Congress, the inability to pass things, regular order, the bipartisanship to get bills through, that they have to rely on these, you know, catch-all bills, this kind of must-pass piece of legislation to attach your things to. Uh, you you get this provision and I'll get this provision. So it's sort yeah, of the so give and that's take. that's the plug your nose theory? Or <laughs> I, it's I, a little bit of give and take. It's an anchovy um, on a pizza. I don't like that anchovy, but to get the pizza, I got to vote for it, right? You plug it is definitely the sausage getting made in, in real time. Uh, and a lot of changes happen between now and December when this bill typically is, is finalized for the year. Um, so, you know, they'll go through an official negotiation between the House and the Senate to work out the price different, the funding differences. I'll let you know that the Senate bill is about $7 billion less than the House bill, which is kind of pocket change around Congress, but it, it certainly is going to be something, you know, all the folks who are interested in this bill from the defense, from the Department of Defense to all the contractors and, and defense industry folks who are looking at our my projects and programs in here, they're all going to go to make sure that at the end of the day, um, that their, their provisions are funded at the levels that they would like. So the reality of this multi-level chess game, right? You've got uh, those that will uh, approach, appropriate those members on the House and the Senate that write the checks, right? And then you have those that tell you what you they'd like you to spend the money on, right? right. And then you've got you know two committee, well, multiple committees on the, both houses. So how does all this come together, Steph, in appropriations? You've got this four-level chess game going, you've got appropriators, you've got authorizers, and most people don't grasp this. You mean you have to have an authorizer and appropriator? I mean, don't they get along? Well, no, they don't get along. So Steph, how do we pay for all this and what happens if we don't come to an agreement by the end of September? Yeah, so there's not gonna be an agreement by the end of September, so we'll start there. Um, so every year Congress has to pass their spending for the next year for the whole government by September 30th, which is the end of the fiscal year. They never do it. So they do what's called a continuing resolution, which is just holds everything steady. Uh, through December, typically, sometimes longer, but normally December. Um, as Ben was explaining, there's authorizing and there's spending. So authorizing says how much can you spend? Appropriation says how much are we going to spend? Here's what's funny. No one has authorized anything for spending at all. They never passed a budget. They don't actually pass budgets very often in Congress anymore. So in the end, when they pass this final bill, they're actually going to have to authorize on top of their spending bill because we actually don't know how much they're supposed to be spending across the board. So what happens is the House does their version, the Senate does their version, 
And right now they're both sitting at different varied levels of spending because they never did pass a budget to set what those top lines will be. Uh, I typically find that fortune favors the higher number, uh, which tends to be the Senate. So uh, I don't think, I've never known Congress to spend less uh, than the year before, even when they're penny pinching. Um, so no, no, that's they've probably... never found a program they don't like. So they keep, no. keep they keep funding. They never eliminate it because it'd be a campaign piece. Oh, you eliminated one program, even though you never used it, it would still be a campaign ad, right? Anyway, yep. Sorry, sorry. And even even to no, even to Ben's point on defense, the NDAA is extremely bipartisan. It passed on a committee 57 to 1. I don't know who that Lone Ranger was who was against it, but um, it's going to, it passed out of the House with um, only 62 Republicans voting no and about 50 Democrats voting no. So kind of bipartisanly split over to the Senate. Um, but the, one of the biggest contentious issues in the appropriations bill is the defense spending level. So you think that's confusing because they just all agreed on their overall ideas and spending for the NDAA but now they're fighting over the nitty gritty of the spending when it came, comes to it. But that's because they can all agree that they want the ability to spend whatever the Pentagon needs, whatever they need to do for, for defense readiness. But when it comes down to the actual appropriation each year, Congress likes to take a closer look at what are our needs for this year? Do we need that many, I'm not gonna say it, it's so controversial, types of plane for that year? Uh, or can we maybe, wait the next year, you know, and, and depending on who you are, where you sit on your opinions about military and war, it becomes pretty controversial. Um, the other big, the, the perennial issue in this bill has always been uh, what's called the Hyde Amendment, which is an amendment which says that money cannot be spent from the federal government on abortion. It actually applies to several other things, but abortion is the number one um, issue. Now this year with the Supreme Court decision being what it was, that is going to be really tough. That's a sticking point for everybody this year uh, because it's always been a sticking point, first of all. But with that, that recent uh, decision, Democrats are much more motivated to win a political point on that uh, and to answer to their constituencies on that. So that's going to be a huge issue. Also, Ben listed some of the interest things that were agreed to in the House, but not yet the Senate and the, the Senate bill uh, or defense bill related to drug use, um, not everyone's on board with uh, unique medical tools, uh, whether that's THC or psychedelics. And those are things that exist currently in the appropriations bill that Republicans are not wanting to keep. And that includes things like safe banking for marijuana in, in states where it's legal. Well, what about your uh, then, Stephanie? Tell us about earmarks or congressionally directed spending. And what, how did that change the, the whole landscape? Well, so earmarks came back last year, which is where each member can have a certain amount of money that he can line item or she on what it's going to be spent on. There are guardrails around that. Um, it has to be a public entity or in some limited cases, a nonprofit entity um, for public good. Um, and that has been obviously a really huge benefit to getting everyone to negotiate and actually finish a bill because um, even though last year they had a really hard time and they had to kick the can all the way until the first quarter of this year before they passed something, it did pass and there wasn't a shutdown because everybody wants their line item that they fought so hard to get. And, you know, a million dollars for a regional airport really doesn't mean much to the federal footprint, but it means a lot to that, that airport that's back home in Iowa, like you said, you know, so those things really help negotiations and helps bring minority party to the table. Um, what's been really interesting about this is that they've had earmarks, but the minority party, the Republicans are not voting for the overall bill even with their earmarks in it. So there's like, they're creating these sort of behind the scenes agreements where they know they're not going to vote for it, but they make sure they have enough votes for it to pass, if that makes sense. So that's kind of how it's changing the game. So when we talk about congressionally directed spending, as you mentioned, that it was they did away with it a number of 10 years, right, or more. I'm not sure what you said. Uh, I, I've always heard from leadership that is there, it's very difficult to control members of Congress as far as a group, you know, and to move legislation. 
And one thing that uh, always seemed to work was projects. And I, I'm a believer that a member of Congress has a better understanding of where money should go into their district and into their state than bless some administrator here in Washington, DC. So I know it's been very controversial, but th the projects have been very specific to public projects across the country, right? And maybe this is for both of you, but it, they, they are really very public directed. Yeah, so that, the argument in favor, I think that, that congressmen have, always, have really supported bringing them back is that the money doesn't change. The, those projects are getting paid for. The question is, does Congress have the right to determine where exactly that money is going to go or do the administrative agencies have that right? It, you know, politically people like to spend, obviously I'm showing my bias on community directed spending, but people like to spend earmarks, community directed spending like they are lining congressmen's pockets. But really the money is going to your local governments, your airports, railroads, things that you need, things that would be funded already through the federal government. Only now your congressman who you elected is getting to decide, at least in part, who gets that money instead of no disrespect, unelected individuals at the administrative level reading a million competitive grants or, or whatever comes their way. We'll also add that it allows the members to have more interaction with their local communities. I mean, you mentioned that you're a big believer that the local, the, the members of Congress have a better understanding. This is just another service that I think a lot of members see that, you know, we are in control of the purse strings. It's our responsibility to bring the needs of our communities to Washington. And so this is an opportunity for those offices to engage with their local elected officials, with nonprofits and organizations and say, you know, our school district's badly in need of investment for the school facilities or mental health programs or you know maybe it's some a major road project that the state dot may not think is a priority but i know and our local government knows is so sometimes it's a way to be able to get around um, what may be barriers whether it's at the federal level or even at the state level so that those local communities get the investment that they're looking for well and to that point ben also it's you know a lot of small states lament that they do not receive their fair share of federal funding. And this is one of many needed solutions to that problem because you have every single member of Congress and whatever you know formula they created gets their little portion of, of earmarked money, including senators, and there's two for every state. So in a way, you know, the smaller states are almost getting, dare I say, more than their fair share, which is which is great because they don't in a lot of other ways, because the bigger states have frankly, bigger, better lobbies to come to DC. Bigger, and make better, sure BBL, bigger, better lobbyists. Yeah, and they've got, you know, 15 members of Congress versus two. So you know, they have a lot more people watching their back and especially people around in the East Coast are the ones who end up working in the administrations. So this is giving, I would say, especially Western and especially small states, more chance to, to get their fair share of federal dollars. Well, and I know we're running a, a little short on time and there are so many other topics that can, one leads to next is kind of like peeling back this onion right and uh, one layer next layer next layer. Uh, I, I just like to open it for a moment Stephanie you'd like to say as we come to conclusion or Ben uh, based on your experience and uh, advice to individuals working with Capitol Hill. I'll jump in. Um, it's seeing this many things that are on the precipice of passage, I think is really exciting. And it really, even though things seem just absolutely awful in terms of partisanship and fighting, it can't be that bad or else we would not be here um, with this many things on the on the precipice of, of passage. So I think that it only, it to me gives me a little hope that we're turning a corner and the, the, it makes me like these close margins uh, of, of congressional representation. That's my yeah. closing remark, I think. And I'll just add, you know, we're, we're supposed to be, this week was officially supposed to be the beginning of the August recess when Washington kind of empties out and the members, you know, spread out all over the, the country and the world. Uh, we saw the speaker is uh, just landed in Taiwan earlier today. Um, 
you know, they're they're gearing up for elections in November. And uh, this this certainly, at least from from the Democrats perspective, shows that, you know, we uh, that being in, tro- in control of the House, the Senate and the White House are able to accomplish things. And and these bipartisan votes um, are are an opportunity to kind of demonstrate, you know, why you were sent to Washington in the first place, whether you were for the bill or against the bill, you have an opportunity over the next few months to make your case to the voters as to uh, why or why not you you were sent to Washington and should be sent back. Well, I, as I hope you learn uh, during our call today that um, Stephanie and, and Ben uh, provide just a wealth of knowledge and empathy and passion for what they do and, and their expertise. You know, our role is to try to give people a perspective and try to find solutions to problems. And I'm really proud of both of you, Stephanie and Ben, and thank you for being a part of this. Because, you know, I started out by talking about the four top issues. So we resolved judicial system in the courts today, right? And we've talked about the abortion issue, although we haven't resolved whatever that is. We've talked about the dysfunction, uh, but we did solve inflation based upon this new bill that's out there. So I feel really good that today we were able to take care of inflation, if nothing else. Uh, And now on a more serious note, uh, I've had the honor for many years to uh, walk friends, family, and constituents uh, through the U.S. Capitol and look forward to being able to do that again, hopefully in the near future. Uh, And some of you have heard me say this, but I always stop in the rotunda and take a moment and reflect upon who we are as a nation. Uh, And and in spite of our challenges and our blemishes, uh, we're still absolutely the best in the world. And I am firmly, uh, I'm I'm a firm believer that members of Congress and the Senate and whichever administration is trying to do what they think is best uh, for not only their their constituents, their communities, their state and the nation. Um, I do believe most are trying very hard to do the right thing for the right reason. So we appreciate uh, the president's comments saying that uh, can't we just put politics aside? Well, I believe today we did. We put politics aside. And as I asked earlier, all I want you to do is sit back and put those politics aside, listen, get engaged, get involved, and be a part of this great nation. So thank you all for joining us on Politics Society. Look forward to seeing you very soon. Be safe.